So far, we've seen caves and bats, dinosaurs and ancient oceans. Georgia is a pretty remarkable state. But there's one more place we're going to explore today that is full of mystery. That place is the Okefenokee Swamp in the southeastern corner of the state near Waycross. The dinosaurs that once roamed Georgia may be extinct, but some of their cousins are very much alive. Alligators are the descendants of crocodiles that were 50 feet long, as big as an 18-wheel truck. They lived here 100 million years ago. Today, their smaller cousins live here, the Okefenokee Swamp. There are still parts of the Okefenokee that no human beings have ever visited. And the wildlife here can seem strange and wonderful. The swamp is a mysterious place. Some people even say there are ghosts here. And when you're out here, all alone, except for the alligators and the birds and the dark forest draped with Spanish moss, it's not so hard to believe there might be ghosts. Don Berryhill knows the swamp and many of its secrets. He's a science specialist with the Okefenokee Regional Education Service Agency. This is a female gator. She stays right in this area here. This is her little domain. She's been in this area now for about two years. So she's about 25 years old. What does she eat? Alligators eat the things that live where they live. And since they live partly in the water and partly on the land, in the water they'd catch things like fish and turtles and frogs and snakes. On the land they might catch a raccoon or a fox or a possum. Uh, Occasionally, we have known them to even catch and eat bear. How can, a, how can an alligator kill a big bear? When bears try to swim a lake or a river or, or a stream in the swamp, they're taking a chance because an alligator can come up from underneath, grab them by the foot, and pull them under, and drown them. And then they can eat at their own leisure. It may seem heartless, but that's life on the food chain here in the swamp. It's eat or be eaten. Even the plants are killers. The pitcher plant, for example, it looks innocent enough, but Don knows differently. The plants you see here, boys, on your right, are called pitcher plants. These plants eat insects, and they catch them by producing an odor and a color. And so insects are attracted, they crawl up the side, and they go underneath the hood because that's where the odor is. And when they get on that lip inside, they slip. And when they fall down inside, there's a digestive enzyme. There's a chemical in there that actually begins to digest them. Just like when we eat food, our chemicals have to digest it for us. They have digestive enzymes that, that break down flies, bugs, grasshoppers, mosquitoes, things like that. Throughout the swamp, plants and animals have adapted to their environment in all kinds of ways in order to survive. The writing spider is another example. This spider makes a zigzag pattern in its web that makes it easy for birds and bats to see so they don't fly into the web and destroy it. So this is a spider's way of letting birds and bats and other animals know that there's a web there because it takes him a long time to weave that web. So that's a survival technique. And this old swamp here is one of the largest freshwater swamps in America, too. It's about 40 miles from here to the other end. It's about 25 miles across. 25 miles east to west, 40 miles north to south. That means the swamp covers nearly 700 square miles, bigger than the city of Atlanta or Los Angeles. Most of the swamp now is a national wildlife refuge where plants and animals are protected by the federal government. That means they can live forever the way nature intended, in a vast ecosystem where every plant and every animal has a purpose, even snakes. Are these poisonous snakes? No, they're not. These are constrictor snakes. Uh, we only have three kinds of poisonous snakes here in South Georgia a moccasin and a rattlesnake and a coral snake. These are non-poisonous. See the round eye? See how his eye is round? 
That tells us that he's a non-poisonous snake. These animals catch and eat things like rats, mice, squirrels, gophers, moles, baby rats, uh, baby rabbits, any kind of small thing that they can handle, reasonably handle. Now, in order to swallow it, they have to open their mouth real wide. See, because here in the corner of their mouth, right here in the corner of their mouth, that right there, they have an extra bone in their mouth that allows their mouth to open well, like that. And then here in the bottom of their mouth, their lower jaw bone, this bone down here, they have two. You and I have one. So he can come like that. <laughs> so he can actually stretch out two to three times larger than himself. The Okefenokee may seem like a place where only snakes and alligators can live, but people have made this their home for thousands of years. Native Americans were living here 4,000 years ago. The Timucuans were here when the first Europeans arrived. They were followed by the Creeks, and then the Seminoles, who eventually moved south to Florida. And then in the mid-1800s, Scots-Irish settlers arrived. Why did they come to such a place? Bill Cribbs can tell us. In the late 1800s, his great-grandfather came here to the Okefenokee and began to farm. Bill is a professor of biology at Valdosta State University, and today he's come back to Billy's Island, the place where his grandparents had their farm. With him is Pete Griffin, a ranger at the Stephen C. Foster State Park. My great-grandfather was Dan Lee, who settled this island in the late 1800s. And all the people that settled down here in South Georgia in those days were subsistence farmers. They literally grew everything that they ate. There was no place to, you know, to go. You couldn't run down to the local grocery store because there weren't any grocery stores. There were no towns down here, no roads. The land down here was fertile and all the people were healthy. In order to get a, a cemetery started down here, they had to kill a man. And the only two people that had ever been added to that cemetery since then was the undertaker and the medical doctor, and they both starved to death. If somebody was going to throw you out, in the continental United States somewhere and a place where you could survive with the least amount of effort, I'd say this swamp would probably be the best place to be. You'd have plenty to eat and, of course, plenty to drink. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the swamp settlers had the place to themselves until the Hebbard Lumber Company bought land in the Okefenokee in 1901. They came to cut the huge cypress trees and turn them into boards and shingles. Cypress wood is valuable because it doesn't rot and it lasts a very long time. The workers came in and the logs were shipped out on a railroad that cut right through the swamp. It's kind of hard to believe that this used to be part of a very powerful steam engine that helped drag the Okefenokee logs to the old mill at Hebbardville. Of course, all that's left of it here is part of the water tank. There were so many people working here that the lumber company built a town for them right here on Billy's Island. The town of Billy's Island was built and my great-grandfather's cornfield. If we could step back to the year about 1920 to 1925, there would have been about 600 people living right here on Billy's Island. And by all accounts, Billy's Island was a pretty wild place in those days. It had a doctor's office, it had a barber shop, and by the way, these were right next door to each other. And so a lot of times you could be sitting there getting your hair cut and you could see the blood running from the doctor's office along the floor under the wall and into the barber shop. <laughs> because a lot of people who got hurt with axes and saws and things in those days had to have their limbs amputated and it had to be done right there in the doctor's office. It's hard to believe there was ever a town here. The lumber company pulled out when the federal government bought the land in 1936 to make a national park. Now only a few rusty machine parts are left. It's as if the swamp was patiently waiting to reclaim the land. But some people believe that the men who cut the giant cypress trees are still here. Their ghosts are in the whispering trees. The workers used to sleep on platforms in the trees at night to keep away from the snakes and the bears. Only some men went up to their platforms and never came down. What would happen in the evening times after work? They'd all climb up into somebody's individual platform, be like four or five guys. And they'd sit there and they'd start playing cards. And, you know, always in a game there's a winner and there's going to be a loser. It just works that way. Well, at the end of the game, 
If the fellow that lost didn't have enough money to pay the man that he owed the money to, that fellow said, you know, no problem. And they'd all retire to their individual platforms and they'd go to sleep. Well, come about maybe three or four in the morning, the fellow that had the money owed to him would go find the fellow that owed him the money, crawl over to his platform, ease up to him and give him an extra smile from ear to ear with a pocket knife. And then he'd ease back into his platform and they'd all just get up the next morning and go right back to work, except for that one poor soul that was up in the platform. Listen, deep in the swamp, in what people here call the whispering trees, you can sometimes hear the ghosts of the murdered tree cutters. It doesn't have to be 12 o'clock midnight. It doesn't even have to be a full moon. But sometimes if you listen off in the distance, you'll hear men yelling or shouting at each other uh, chains rattling, and all it is are these poor souls that are working in here trying to earn enough money to pay off their gambling debt so they can get out of here. The legends of the Okefenokee live on, and the swamp has recaptured its wild beauty. Now the Okefenokee is a state and national park, and it belongs to us all. There are still lots of places left to see in this state, and there are still lots of people I'd like you to meet. This is Georgia Stories. I'm Colin Cedor. Thanks. <laughs>